The Witch of Blackbird Pond Chapter 4 As the heavy door shut behind him, the cloud gradually lifted from the room. Rachel moved nervously to the table and began to wrap the leftover cornbread in a clean linen napkin. Before I do another thing, she said, I must take this to Widow Brown. She's still far too weak to fend for herself. Forgive me for leaving you, Catherine, but I'll be back in no time at all. In no time, echoed Judith bitterly as her mother hurried out into the foggy morning. Just as soon as she's built up the fire and made gruel and tidied the whole cabin, with more than a day's work waiting here at home. Why, Judith, Mercy rebuked her gently, what would you have her do? You know what scriptures tell us about caring for the poor and the widows. But there's no scripture saying mother has to be the one to do all the caring, Judith retorted. She wears herself out over people like Widow Brown, and honestly, Mercy, if mother were ill, how many of them do you think would lift a finger to help? I'm sure they would, said Mercy promptly. Besides, that's not the point. You'll give Kit a fine impression of us, Judith. And anyway, we'd better start on the work that's waiting right here. Judith did not move. Her attention had turned again to the row of trunks. Do you mean to say that every one of those trunks is full of dresses like the one you have on? Well, dresses and petticoats and slippers and such. You have the same things yourself, don't you? Mercy's laugh was a ripple of silver. <laughs> but we don't. We can't even imagine. I can, said Judith. I've seen the ladies in Hartford. Kit, how soon are you going to open them? Right now, if you like, said Kit willingly. Mercy was shocked. Judith, what will our cousin think of us? Besides, there's all the work to be done. Oh, Mercy, there's always work. I don't know, said Mercy doubtfully. Father says the Lord loveth not idleness. But then... The Lord doesn't send us a new cousin every day. Perhaps he would forgive us for a little rejoicing. Oh, come, Kit, show us now, urged Judith, taking advantage of her sister's uncertainty. Kit was only too willing. As the first lid opened, all the constraint was gone. Kit had never known many girls her own age. Her own eagerness rose at the sight of the two eager faces so close to hers. How amazing that a few clothes could cause such excitement. Kit felt a surge of generosity that was new and exhilarating. Imagine, cried Judith, pulling out a handsome gown of flimsy silk. Five slits on the sleeves. Our minister preached against slit sleeves, and Father won't let us make even one. And so many ribbons and bows. And, oh, Kit, a red satin petticoat. How gorgeous. Here are the gloves, Kit opened a box. There's a pair just like mine, Judith, and a pair for you, Mercy. Please, you must take them. Judith had the gloves on before the sentence was finished and stood stretching out her slender arms admiringly. Mercy stroked hers with a timid finger and laid them gently aside. Then Judith pounced on the dresses. Try it on, suggested Kit, seeing that Judith could scarcely take her eyes from the bright peacock blue patio soy. Judith needed no urging. Dropping her own homespun skirt unashamedly on the floor, she drew the shining folds over her head. Why, tis perfect, exclaimed Kit. It makes your eyes look almost green. Judith tiptoed across the floor, straining to see herself in the one small dim mirror that hung over a chest. Truly, in the vivid dress, Judith was breathtaking, and she did not need the mirror to tell her so. Oh, if William could see me in this, she breathed, ignoring Mercy's worried protests. Kit laughed delightedly. Well, tis yours, Judith. T'was made just for you, and there's a little cap with ribbons to match. Now, where did I put it? There! Now, which one will be best for Mercy? Goodness, what use would I have for such things, Mercy laughed. I scarcely ever get to meeting. Kit hesitated, chagrined. 
but Judith's eyes had fallen on a light blue wool, and she lifted it impulsively. This would be perfect for mercy, she exclaimed. Kit unfolded the delicate English shawl and dropped it across Mercy's shoulders. Oh, Kit, how beautiful. I never felt anything so soft, like a kitten's fur. Delight and protest struggled in Mercy's face. I can't take anything so lovely. Judith was back at the mirror. Just wait till I walk into meeting in this on Sunday morning, she squealed. A few people I know won't hear a word of the sermon. Why, girls, what on earth? Rachel Wood had come back unnoticed, and she stood now staring at her daughter in the peacock blue gown with something half fear and half hunger in her eyes. Oh, mother, look what Kit has given me, cried Judith. I am looking, stammered her mother. Judith, you look, I scarcely know you. You should, Aunt Rachel, Kit spoke boldly, because you must have looked exactly like that yourself. I know, because Grandfather had told me how beautiful you were. The two girls stared at their mother in astonishment. Rachel looked dazed. I had a dress just that color once, she said slowly. Kit dived impulsively into the trunk. Put this on, Aunt Rachel, she coaxed. See, it ties under your chin like this. Oh, tis just perfect. Go and look at yourself. Rachel shied away from the mirror, her cheeks pink with excitement. Under the little beribboned bonnet that years had dropped away from her face. At her brilliant eyes and tremulous smile, her daughter stared in unbelief. Oh, mother, wear that on Sunday. Promise you will. But the color had suddenly drained from Rachel's face. A chill swept across the room from the abruptly opened door. On the threshold stood Matthew Wood, staring from his awful height at the littered room, the gowns tumbled over chairs and benches, and the guilty faces of his women folks. What is the meaning of this? he demanded. The girls were watching Catherine unpack, Rachel explained helplessly. How are you back so soon, Matthew? Can a man not come back for an axe helve without finding his house a shambles? I guess we forgot ourselves. Rachel's fingers jerked at the bonnet strings. Judith was not so easily intimidated. Look, father, she attempted. Kit has given me this dress. Did you ever see anything so handsome? Give it back to her at once. Father, no, I never had. Do as I say, he thundered. Uncle Matthew, broke in Kit, you don't understand. I want her to have the dress. Her uncle regarded her with scorn. No one in my family has any use for such frippery, he said coldly. Nor are we beholden to anyone's charity for our clothing. But they are gifts, cried Kit, tears of hurt and anger springing to her eyes. Everyone brings, be quiet, girl. It is time you understood one thing at the start. This will be your home since you have no other, but you will fit yourself to our ways and do no more to interrupt the work of the household or to turn the heads of my daughters with your vanity. Now you will close your trunks and allow them to get about the work they have neglected. Rachel, take off that ridiculous thing. Even the gloves, father? Judith was still rebellious. Everyone wears gloves to meeting. Everything. No member of my household will appear in public with such unseemly apparel. Mercy had said no word, but now as she folded the blue shawl and laid it quietly on top of the trunk, Rachel found courage for her own protest. Will you allow Mercy to keep the shawl, she pleaded. Tis not gaudy, and twill keep off the draft there by the chimney. Matthew's glance moved from the shawl to his daughter's quiet eyes, and barely, perceptibly, the grim line of his jaw relaxed. So there was one weakness in this hard man. Very well. Mercy may keep the shawl. I thank you for it. The bitter word was forced out just in time. Had it not been for this hint of grace, Kent's anger might have erupted in a scene that would have spoiled all her chances 
on this first morning. As it was, she felt an unwilling respect that made her hold her tongue and set to work folding and replacing the piles of clothing. Judith's tears were packed away in the folds of the blue dress. There was silence after the door had shut once more. Well, sighed Rachel, tis all my fault. I can't blame you girls, but at my age, and the board not even cleared from breakfast. Kit looked back at the table curiously. Don't the servants do that, she inquired. We have no servants, said her aunt quietly. Surprise and chagrin left Kit speechless. I can help with the work, she offered finally, realizing that she sounded like an over-eager child. In that dress, Judith protested. I'll find something else. Here, this calico will do, won't it? To work in? Disappointment had put an edge to Judith's tongue. Tis all I have, retorted Kit. Give me something of yours, then. Judith's cheeks went scarlet. Oh, wear that one. You can help Mercy with the carding. You won't dirty yourself at that. Kit shortly repented her offer. For four mortal hours, she sat on a wooden bench and struggled to grasp the tricky process of carding wool. Mercy demonstrated on two pieces of thin board to which were fastened strips of leather set with hooked wire teeth. From a great pile of heavy blue wool, she pulled a small tuft caught it in the wire teeth of one board, and drew it across the second board until the fibers were brushed flat. Isn't the color pretty, she inquired. Mother promised Judith that if she helped with the shearing this year, she could buy some indigo from the West Indies. Judith hates handling the greasy wool and washing it, but she will be happy with the blue cloth. In one deft motion, she plucked the wool from the teeth and rolled it into a fluffy ball. It looked so easy, but the moment Kith took the wool card into her hands, she appreciated Mercy's skill. They were such awkward things. The wool fluffed and stuck to her fingers and snarled in clumps. She suspected that Judith had chosen this task on purpose. And we'll pause here and continue this in the next video. Till then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thank you so much for watching. I love you guys. Bye-bye.